forgot to push the button. Good morning and welcome to our Bible study this morning. We are studying excellence and praise and worship. Travis, when are the books supposed to get in? Do you know? In them next week. Okay. So in the meantime, if you have a need for the outlines of the things that we're studying, you didn't get a book, then uh, contact Travis and he can get it to you electronically and you'll be able to follow along. You can print them out, do whatever you need to do. But we, we had 120 books printed. So if you, if you uh, ended up with a couple and you want to bring one back, that'd be great for folks that don't have one. But anyway... So we're ready to get started this morning, and if you're joining us online, we're certainly glad to have you with us as well. Uh, we're going to be studying from Psalms 95. We'll be looking at a lot of other scriptures today too. So have your Bible ready to uh, look at those scriptures with us as we uh, as we do the study this morning. I've asked Mark uh, Colson if he would to word our opening prayer as we get ready for our Bible study this morning. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious, Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you for this another beautiful day you've given us. So many blessings, we cannot put a number on them. We're thankful for this avenue of prayer that we can come to you and petition you and ask you to forgive us for we know we fall short sometimes, we stumble, we fall. Ask you to forgive us of those we know you will and you'll forget them from this point on. We're thankful for this group that's gathered here today we pray that the studies that we have will soak into our hearts and and we'll be better christians for being here today than we have in the past be with those of this number that are sick and need a healing hand and those are about to have procedures that all will, will go well uh, be with our teachers and, and we're thankful for the for them and and the work that they put in to to teach the young ones that we have at this congregation as you go with throughout this study and pay attention and, and learn from the things we're about to receive. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. And uh, several things Mark talked about with regard to being thankful this morning. And I guess that's probably what I want to start with a little bit is as we look at the text of Psalms 95, which is the key text for the lesson, and you look at the top of the lesson. If you don't have it, just open your Bible to Psalms 95 and 1 through 3. Psalms 95, 1 through 3. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. So let me start out by asking you a question. Start out with a question, okay? What does Thanksgiving mean to us in the worship service? What does Thanksgiving mean to you in the worship service? You didn't know I was going to hit you with a question right off the bat, did you? Gratitude. I like that. It means gratitude. What else does it mean? What? Strength. Thanksgiving strength. Appreciation. I like this. One word, thanks, gratitude, appreciation. What else? Humility. Absolutely. Humility. Love. Thanksgiving means humility and love. What else does it mean? Devotion. Devotion. What else? These are great. Meditation. Thinking about. Okay, what else does it mean? Acknowledgement. A simple acknowledgement of the great gratitude that we have, of the humility that we should have for what we have been blessed with. Reflection. Reflection. I like that one too. Ryan, was that you? Thankful. Brad said indebtedness. LR? This is different from the holiday you celebrate. It's not the same as watching football or the Macy's or 
Right. Right. Yeah, and I'm, I was going to get into that a little bit. Yeah, and you kind of segued me to that. It always happens, doesn't it, Travis? Somebody always gives you a segue. And when you think about Thanksgiving and the holiday that we celebrate once a year, that's been going on since I think it was 1789 is how long that's been going on. And, and it was started by George Washington and Congress. And they moved the dates around, but it ended up, I think it was Roosevelt, that said, okay, it's going to be the fourth Thursday of the month of November. And when you think about that kind of Thanksgiving, what do you think about? You think about the parade, you think about the ball games, but when you think about that meal, what do you think about with regard to that holiday? What God has given us, that's a good one. So fortunate, so lucky to have this. And when it was instituted, it was part of a use of the remnants of the harvest in the fall to say, look at the great bounty that we have. Look at what we have been blessed with. And when you think about that big spread, do you have gratitude for what you've been blessed with when you, you, know, you get together with family or friends and you focus on that? And you think about that kind of thanksgiving. Then we think about what we were talking about just a minute ago. The thanksgiving that we have to God for all that he has blessed us with. So the question is also with regard to the thanksgiving that we give, how does God feel about what we give him? How does God feel about what we give him? Are we giving him the, le or is Thanksgiving when we have that meal, is it about leftovers? What's it about? It's about rejoicing. It's about, okay, favorite dish. What do you want? Okay, I want sweet potatoes with the little marshmallows on top. I want fruit salad. I want, well, do you want turkey? I mean, what is it, tryptophan and turkey that makes you sleepy? And, and then we sometimes tend to overindulge and it's Uncle Joe's passed out on the chair and people are walking by because he's half there. Um, but when we think about those things and what, what we, the joy we get out of that, does joy get, does God get joy? How does God feel about what we give him with regard to Thanksgiving? when we come to the worship service, okay? So we talked about when we come here. How else, what else does Thanksgiving look like in our lives every day? Some of those same things, right? But what'd you say? Sharing. Sharing. Dwight? The holidays for us during the year of us to receive. This Thanksgiving go from January 1 to December 31st. Okay, so he talked about it being, you know, the holidays one day. Thanksgiving for God is from January 1 to December 31st. And that's the way it should be in our lives every day. And how do we do that? We, all those things I think we talked about before apply. But what else do we do in our lives every day to show Thanksgiving to God? Obey the truth. Our prayers, that was again one that I'd thought about too with regard to giving thanksgiving. And, you know, we do that at a meal, and again, that's the time that we traditionally think about a prayer to God is when we're having a meal and being thankful for what we've been blessed with. Or maybe when the day ends or the day begins. Uh, but uh, what other things show thanksgiving to God every day in our lives? Making sacrifices. Like what, Dave? Not doing, things. not doing certain things. Not doing certain things that we might want to do, but we know we shouldn't do. Because we want to please God. Joanne? Not complaining. Not complaining. Not complaining. Does anybody, well, don't raise your hand. <laughs> don't raise your hand. But do any of us ever complain? Is it, 
Is it easy to get caught up in all the stuff that's going on around us and we want to complain? What else in our lives every day reflects thanksgiving? How we treat others. What else? Pray with confidence. I think that's a fantastic one too. Because if we are truly thankful for what God has done for us, we can and should and are commanded to pray with confidence that he hears our prayers and he knows our needs. So all of these things are so important when we think about thanksgiving to God. Now, some of the things we've talked about will probably come up again during the course of our lesson. But, you know, when you think about... Oh, I forgot the controller. I'm so excited here this morning. I got the... Uh, I left the switcher up on the stand here. When we think about all the things that we have been blessed with, and we look at what it says, and again, Psalms 95, 1 through 3, and again, read it again. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In the Old Testament, in the Psalms, many times they were either commanded or encouraged to sing songs of thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good is a common component of how those Psalms looked and sounded. Uh, Paul also provides for us in the New Testament many things for us to think about with regard to thanksgiving and how it should be manifested in our lives. In prayer, in worship, in praise, the love that we have for God, but also the love that we have for one another. The love that we have for one another. Uh, if you will open your Bibles to Colossians, the first chapter, and I'm going to read that, so if you don't mind, re read along with me. Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians 1, and let's look at verses 3 through 14. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always we give thanks to him. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. And you also learn from Epaphras, our, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us, your love in the spirit for this reason we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and he's translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. When I read that, I think about the thanksgiving that Paul says that he has through those uh, through, with the brothers and sisters in Christ, the love that he has for him, them and how he is thankful for them. Do we have that same kind of love toward one another? To show thanksgiving, does it mean that we should love one another? I think it does. I think that's part of what we see in the writings that Paul has. And in many of, of the letters that he wrote, it's a common thread with regard to the thanksgiving that he gives for his brothers and sisters in Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he gives thanks in everything for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And in Romans 1 and 8, it says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. 
So what about having thankfulness for one another? Is that an important part of our worship to God? Donna over here, Donna Whiteside. Donna, can Okay, talk, speak up. We pray for each other and we should thank God when our prayers are answered. That goes back to what David was talking about with regard to praying and believing that God hears our prayers. You know, that's the other thing too. Have you ever been in a situation where you got something going on and you think, should I really tell anybody about it? Do I really need the prayers of the congregation or do I want to keep it quiet? That says a lot about not only our confidence in God hearing our prayers and praying with confidence, but it also says something about our trust and confidence in our brothers and sisters to pray for us and what their prayer can mean. So how important is that in our lives every day? Why do we sometimes not want to do that? Why do we sometimes not want to do that? Pride. That's all my notes, by the way. Pride, 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 pride. And pride manifests itself in such a way that either we're not willing to humble ourselves or I think I got this, I don't, I don't, need, I don't need prayers or I, I don't know. Okay, L.R. said sometimes we might think that our request is petty. And again, we, we need to understand that God knows what's important and he's going to do everything he can to help us in whatever need we might have. So when we come to the worship service, the preparation that we make to come to the worship service, uh, that's important. And the example that we're looking at in the book is that in Leviticus, the 16th chapter, in verses 1 through 34. Um, when we think about coming into his presence, and y'all talked about all those things a few minutes ago and did a great job with regard to how we should come into his presence. What about the example that we're given on the Day of Atonement when Aaron goes before God? It's a great example. And Aaron performs... So many things uh, for the atonement of Israel. And so this chapter in, in Leviticus 16 and 1 through 34 basically says, here's all the things that I want you to do, Aaron, to come before me. Okay? And is it important, was it important for Aaron to observe all those things? Was it important for him to do that? Why was it important? It was the commandment of God. It was what God commanded. And did Nadab and Abihu find out that God meant what he says in chapter 10 earlier? What did they find out? They died. They died because they did not do what God commanded them to do. That's what they found out. He had specific animal sacrifices. I mean, there were certain procedures that he was to follow. And if you haven't read that, go back and read through it and look at all of the things that he specifically had to do, that God commanded him to do, and then how he was to prepare himself, how he was to take off like the royal garb associated with being the high priest. Why did he do that? What was that a sign of? Humility. humility. That was a sign of humility. And what did he put on? White garment, basically the clothing of a slave. Being in subjection to. He had to cleanse himself. He had sacrifices that he had to make in specific ways. He followed 21 specific steps as outlined by the scriptures in cleansing himself and making the sacrifices. And then even he came back out and all of these steps were what God said you are to do to please me. So how do we think about coming into the presence of God 
when we're part of the worship service. We don't have to do all the things that Aaron did. And we come into God's presence through what? Through faith. But what also gives us the opportunity to come into the presence of God? The blood of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. That's what gives us the ability to come into the presence of God. So we don't have to go through what Aaron went through, but do we have to prepare ourselves? We do. David's got a comment back there, Mark. We do have to prepare ourselves, and we have to think about that every time. God doesn't have to justify to us uh, what he wants us to do. Great. If, if we think that um, we can reason that this or that makes no sense and we shouldn't have to do this or that before we worship him, we don't understand who he is. Um, th that's essentially what he said to Job when he said, okay, now you answer me. Um, so we just have to accept what his word is. He says, be anxious for nothing. So that's a that's a really a good instruction. Yeah. But um, uh, we've got to obey him in order to uh, to be able to do that. Right. Right. So when we come into God's presence, what does that look like? And we talked about some of those things. But what can we not let be going on inside of us when we come into God's presence? What what are things that we got to be careful of? when we come into the presence of God to worship him. Lay everything, aside. Lay everything aside. Is that sometimes hard to do? Yeah, I see a lot of heads shaking that that is sometimes hard to do. That is sometimes hard to do. What, what are some of those things that can get in the way? Worldly things. Worldly things. Oh, I got this job thing. What my, my week? It's going to be a oh, it's going to be a hard week. It's going to be. A, I got auditors in the building this week, and what are they going to expect of me? And if I don't stay focused, I'm going to drift off into that. Or what about small children? Can small children sometimes, you know, add to that? We are certainly blessed to have all the kids that we have, and I am so thankful. And all the elders, and I know all of us as members are thankful too. But we had a time in our lives where we were balancing a couple of kids at that age. And it is, you got to see to their needs, but then you got to do the best you can to see to God's needs with regard to his expectations of us too. But remember, God's the three big O's. So he knows what's going on in my head and what's going on in my heart. He is with us. He is in our presence but just like we say right here when we look at the difference between what happened with Nadab and Abihu and what happened with the high priest as he goes into the temple to us it should say God has an expectation of us when we come into the worship service and we've got to do the very best we can to please him When we think about the sacrifice of Christ and what he did for us and has he, he gave his life, Matthew 27, 51, think about the veil of the temple torn, ripped open, and giving access to God by man through Christ. And we have to constantly remind ourselves of that great sacrifice. His sacrifice and his resurrection that gives us a hope of eternal salvation. And, you know, the question is, do we really stop and think about the access that we have to God through Christ? His crucifixion and his resurrection. John 14, 6, Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one has access to the Father except through me. Is that something that we should have thanksgiving about? And what does it say about Christ's love for us? It says everything, John, that's right. It says everything about God's love for us. 
And if that much love was given to me through God, through Christ, then what am I giving back to him? And that's the kind of thing, Brian, we need to be meditating on and thinking about with regard to what I am giving God, not only when I come to the worship service, but every day of my life. And when we think about the fact that God is with us and he knows everything, he knows every thought that every person in this auditorium and other rooms are having right now. Is he pleased with us? Is he pleased with who we are and what we're doing? Or are we preoccupied with something else? I got a ball game I want to watch this afternoon. Or I wonder if we'll get out on time. And Travis alluded to that the other day too. Because we're going to lunch and I want to beat the crowd. You know, what always has amazed me is that a sporting event means so much to somebody that they're willing to forgo a worship service to do that or a concert. Again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to just pick on one group of our individual vices or things that we like to do. But if we forsake being with God in the presence of God with those of a like precious faith because of what we know has been given to us for something else, then what are we saying about what's really important to us? Self-gratification. Self-gratification. Travis? Well, those priests, as we talked about last uh, Wednesday, it took eight days for them to be consecrated so they could go into temple service. It took Aaron 21 steps, as high, or the high proof the high priest was, multiple steps to go into God's presence. And then in all of that, that, you know, if God said, if you want to come into my presence and worship me, Christian, that's what you've got to do, we should say, fine. Eight days, 21 steps, whatever, 121 steps, a whole year. Right. It's worth it. But what, what always strikes me about God is how unbalanced the equation is because God said, that's not good enough. I'm going to send my son. He's going to tear the veil down, and you can come into his presence without eight days of preparation or 21 steps or what have you. Um, God was worthy of praise before that. How much more worthy is he now that he has sent his son as a sacrifice and enabled us in that way? Um, Thanksgiving in the presence of God ought to be pretty easy. If we, I think Brian's word really sh struck me. It just takes meditation. Just take a few minutes and think about it. Right. Yeah, okay, thanks. And we, I don't think we do it enough. I don't think we meditate enough about anything because guess what? We're on to the next thing. I had a conversation with someone earlier in the week about this right here. And, you know, it's like, first thing out of bed, I get on my phone, I'm checking my messages, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And this individual said, I've really got a problem with my phone. Now, how many of us would be willing to admit that? Yeah, John says throw them away. And AT&T and Verizon and everybody else is going to be very disappointed. You know, I may throw mine away here very soon. Morse code, smoke signals. That's how we communicate with people from now on. But again, it goes back to our meditation, our preparation, making sure that we are ready. But it is, it is an attitude that we have to decide that we're going to develop to please God in a way that he would have us please him. And we have to choose that attitude. We have to either choose to let the world consume us or we have to choose to have joy and thanksgiving in our lives the way that we live every day. LR, do you need a mic or Mark's behind you there. One thing I was going to say is uh, it's okay to pray before we come to service to have the right attitude. Pray, Absolutely. We're praying to God to help us have the right attitude. And that's a good thing to do. That's part of that meditation I think you're talking about. 
even in the opening prayer, pray that our worship be uh, uh, acceptable to him. And I think that's a good thing. It's a, uh, there's times before I knew I was going to have to be head of the Lord's table that I prayed about that to help me sure. do a good job sure. not, so that it's a glory to him. Right. And so this attitude of being what we need to be and doing what we need to do, uh, it, it is so important when we come to the worship service. What about guys? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of single guys out to the point of what LR's talking about. If we've got a responsibility to lead a prayer, uh, and you know you're on the list and you're going to lead that prayer, do you put any thought at all into what you are going to pray before you come? If you've got the responsibility for the Lord's Supper, well, th there's two things there. If you've got the responsibility for the Lord's Supper, first of all, you need to prepare yourself for what you're going to say. Because you've got the responsibility of that great commandment to lead all of the souls that are in this room that are Christians and what we're thinking about as we do that. That's a big deal. Not that any of this other stuff's not a big deal too. Song leader, if I'm a song leader, then, you know, is it important for me to do the best I can to prepare and go through the songs that I'm going to see and see if they're harmonious in the message that I'm trying to convey in our worship service? Or do I wait until five minutes before I leave the house and I pick out my songs? And the other part of what I want to say, and I'll get to Brian here in just a minute, but if you're on the list and you've got a responsibility, and that list gets sent out, it's available in the back of the building, right? I mean, there's several different ways you can get that list. And I've heard Kelly say to guys, look, if you're on the list and you can't be there, Please let somebody know. That's just taking a little bit of responsibility initiative because what happens when that person that has responsibility for singing, leading the singing or leading a prayer or the Lord's Supper just doesn't show up? What happens? We're scrambling to try and find somebody to take that person's place and then that person has got to try and do the best they can to prepare themselves for that responsibility that's been put on them at the last minute. So again, that's difficult too. So all of these things matter. Brian. I've said this before, but I just think that in Nehemiah chapter 2 is just a wonderful example of the, the kind of person that I'd love to be able to develop to be when the, he's before the king and the king asks him why he said, and in between answering that question between the king ending that question and him answering, it says that Nehemiah prayed to the God of heaven. And that, that's just incredible. I mean, that prayer is amazing because we don't know what he said, but we know that his heart was, okay, this is a moment I need help. This is a moment. I'm, it's not recorded what he says, but his attitude. And that's, that should be our every day, every decision, every part of our life how we live it really should and it's kind of like the old thing have you seen the example too before of like where you take a big clear glass thing and somebody pours sand in it or you know what are we filling ourselves up with what are we filling our minds and our hearts with what is what is it that drives who we are in a day what is it that gives us direction and how we deal with things that happen in our lives during the course of the day you know, I bet you if you ask David and Debbie uh, with regard to all the things that have been going on with her health this year, the thing that kept them sane and on track was their devotion to God, their prayer to God, the encouragement provided by other people that are in this congregation and outside of this congregation, and, and just a confidence to know that whatever happens, it's going to be okay. How'd I do? I got a thumbs up. <laughs> Dwight? The thing about what we were talking about a moment ago, that person that's not going to be here, does not inform someone, the one that replaces him, does not have time to meditate to think about what he's going to say. Right. We've got the, and he was just talking about for the person has a responsibility and, you know, are there times we can totally forget it? Yeah, that's true, but... We need to think about the awesomeness of the responsibility that we've agreed to take on whatever it is 
with regard to leading the worship service. So don't lose sight of that. Okay, just for a little repetition here, because repetition is the way that you, uh, that you remember stuff. That's what it says in 95, 1 through 3, that we are to do those things because of who he is and what he has done for us. And we've got to do the best we can to uh, do that every time that we come into the worship service. When we think about God, we think about who we are and we think about what he is. We think about what he has done for us. We think about the blessings that we have through him. And if we come into this worship service, and I think Jonathan said something about this the other day, and it was a great comment, uh, Jonathan Holden. He was talking about how we approach the worship service and the things that we do. Is it easy sometimes for the things to just be a rote act that we participate in? What about when somebody gets up to read the scripture? Are you off in la-la land or are you really trying to pay attention to the scripture that's being read? What about when we sing a song? Are you thinking about the words that the song says or are you just blindly following the best that you can? What about when we take the Lord's Supper? Do you really think about that sacrifice that was made that gave us access to God through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Those are the things that are important that we really need to be focused on because what you eat for lunch today doesn't matter. Or whatever problem you've got that you're trying to deal with it's a whole lot easier to deal with if we participate in those things in the worship service in the way that we should. Thanksgiving, joy, understanding the sacrifice that was made to give us the opportunity that we have. A couple of other scriptures here. Um, that you might want to take a look at and write down if you're making notes. Thanksgiving is really a state of mind uh, on what Christ has done for us, what God did for us through Christ. And we need to uh, think about that. Before the foundation of the world, he saved us through his son Jesus Christ, that through his love for us we could be perfected eternity, but only through the blood of Christ. Colossians 1, uh, 13 and 14, whoops, Yes, Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, He's delivered us from the power of darkness, the world, Satan, and conveyed unto us the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption can only be accessed through the blood of Christ. Is that a reason for thanksgiving? Is that a reason for thanksgiving? Is that something we can do for ourselves? We cannot the only man that could did it, and we need to be thankful for it. You sometimes come into the worship service when you've got pain, physical pain, or maybe mental pain. Do you do, you do that? Anybody ever come to the service in pain? Yes. So Gene says yes. Well, if you come into the worship service with pain, uh, whatever kind of pain it might be, whether it's physical or it's mental, it's a heart pain, then how does that pain get taken care of? If you've got problems in your life, are you more likely to be able to deal with those problems by not being here or by being here? What do you think? Stephanie, be here if you can, John says. Stephanie, what, what do you got? I've always said that, I mean, I'm always in pain, and I'm going to hurt no matter where I'm at home or I'm here. And I would much rather be here and get the encouragement of the brethren and of God and of being here to worship than at home. You know, so I don't have, I mean, it's, it's I'm always hurting. So it's, it's just... You just have to make the decision. So uh, that physical pain is, is really a deal for sure. But what about 
pain in my heart. My life's not with God the way that it should be. Is that when people sometimes begin to reject God and don't want to be here? That goes back to pride too, Travis. It goes back to pride and shame. And he's the only one that can forgive us. So why would we not come to him and look for what only he can give? You know, when we look at Job and Bill's the Job man, he was ta he's talked about Job several times. And when I'm not going to read it now, but go back and look 38, 39, 40 into 42 and reread that this afternoon. And look at what happened. When God was talking to Job, he says, uh, where were you when this happened and this happened and this happened and I did this and I restrained the tides of the ocean to stop? I, I did all of these things and where were you? And Job finally comes back in 42 and, and says, you know, I need to keep my place. I need to understand who I am and who you are. And we need to be able to do the same. We need to make sure that we don't have such a high opinion of ourselves that we're not willing to submit to God and give him what he commands but also deserves. And if our relationship with God is not what it needs to be, then we have allowed something to get between us and God. You ever feel like you've done that? You ever feel like you've let something come between you and God? Maybe sometimes it's subtle and you don't really understand it or recognize it, but sometimes it's, uh, it's more specific. Dwight and then Bill. If we're in the house of God, there's less distraction there from the world. Okay. If we're in the house of God, there's less distraction from everything that's going on in the world. Bill? You know, he's talking about pain. And, you know, I can't imagine much more pain than what, Job went through. Right. I, I mean, just imagine. Right. From the top of your head to your big toe. Right. There's boils festered and right. bleeding and running, and he's sitting in a bed of ashes. But at one thing that about Job, never one time did he even come close to another subject you're talking about of, of turning his back on God. It never even entered his mind to, to turn his back on God. And, and look at the, uh, he's talking about the, the mental pain that he had. He had just lost 10 children too. Right, right. Yeah, it's, we've got so many great examples of, of things that have happened historically that we need to be aware of and that we need to make sure happen uh, or, or that we should be able to relate to. But what we do have to understand, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to go to the I'm going to go to the questions, is that everything we have comes through God's love, the sacrifice of Christ, His blood and resurrection, so that we can be with God, and we've got to do the best we can to let our lives reflect that. So, question one: Why is it important to come in the presence of God with reverence? Why? He demands it. That's his expectation of us, but also because we love him and we appreciate what has been done for us. He deserves it. Todd said. Great point, Todd. To recognize that I am totally dependent on him, Mark, uh, Matt over here, that I'm totally dependent on him. That, and you're right, that is what this class is about, excellence and praise and worship. And it's like Travis said, who would believe that we could talk about this for a quarter? But I'm telling you, that's part of the meditation process that we all need to participate in to make sure that we understand who we are and what he is. Matt? It's on. In the climactic point of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, there's a paradox that we approach God in joyful um, praise to him. But at the end of Hebrews 12 and verse 28, it says, For our God is a consuming fire, so we worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. But let us be thankful, because we are now kingdom citizens. And when you understand that, 
you are now a kingdom citizen because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. You can approach God uh, with joy, with gratitude, like we've talked about, yeah, with thankfulness good. in our hearts that we can do that. Thank you. That's a good point. Okay, so uh, everybody, thanks for your comments. We will be on Lesson uh, 1.6 on Wednesday night, and that talks a little bit more about singing, coming to His presence with singing. So we'll talk about that. We might even sing. All right. Thank you. <laughs>